Greetings, minders. Welcome back to the Mind of Watercolor. Steve Mitchell here today with you. Do a quick little uh, demo. I'm not going to paint uh, anything in particular. We're going to revisit uh, blends. Blending is, uh, I did a series of blending videos way back towards the beginning of this channel, and it's been one of the most watched series that I've done. It's, it's critical and basic and fundamental to learning how to control watercolor. But I want to expand on it a little bit. Just kind of do a refresher and talk about some alternative ways that you can blend that you may not have thought of. And this was sort of spurred on by a question when I did the uh, winter leaf in the last video and I used some dry brush. So we're going to cover that and bring a little more detail to uh, some other aspects of blending you may not have tried or may not have thought of. But first, let's just do a basic refresher on what I mean by a blend. Whenever I teach watercolor to a class of beginners who are just learning how to get their feet wet, no pun intended, we always start with a flat wash. This is the first thing anybody learning how to do watercolor for the first time should learn to do, is to make a wash and make it perfectly flat with no hard edges and no splotchy spots. Doesn't mean that forever you'll be painting in perfectly flat washes. It just means you know how to control the water and the pigment, okay? When you dip your water, excuse me, when you dip your brush in the water and it comes out dripping wet, that is totally saturated. That's the most water. And you can add a lot or a little bit. When you take away water, that's what your rag's for. And I always recommend that you have a rag, not a paper towel. You can have a paper towel too. That's good for like very quick little adjustments because at some point you're going to want to squeeze and take out as much of the moisture that you can. Those are the two extremes, dripping, sopping wet, and squeeze to as dry as you can get. But in reality, watercolor lets you create any level of moisture in your brush in between that. I'm constantly making micro adjustments. I may just dip the tip in my brush just if it's a little too dry. I may even wipe it there. I may even wipe it here. So that's just a preface uh, to remind you that uh, there is not one amount of water and one amount of pigment. It varies greatly throughout your painting. So you want to know how to change it. So that's that's sort of the basic beginner lecture. And inevitably after that, the next wash that you learn is a blend. How to go from this, let me get a little more color in here. I'm on an incline, so everything's running to the bottom. How to go from this and blend that out to no color. I take the pigment out of my brush. I reduce the amount of water. And it's like a magnet action. I put just enough water on the paper to pull that pigment over. The two basic ways of controlling watercolor, two, we're going to look at some more advanced ways. If you're still back here and you're still struggling with this, this is what you need to work on, okay? I, there's no other way to say it. Practice this until you can do either of these in your sleep, literally. I mean, yeah, you can go on and paint whatever you want um, and have fun. I'm not saying that you can't, but this will great pay great dividends. Do these until you can do them almost perfectly in your sleep. All that means is that you have taught yourself the basic rudiments of control. Controlling water and controlling pigment. All right, enough said. We're not here to learn about this. I will put the links to my basic blending technique videos and pigment water ratio videos. I'll put those down in the description in case you want to review those or in case maybe you haven't even seen them. But you know, a perfect flat wash and a perfectly blended out wash are not always what you're looking to do. Let me just draw a circle. So I've got a little bit different shape here to work with. You can do this on any kind of shape that you want. It doesn't have to be perfect. It doesn't even have to be a circle. So we're going to look at dry brush. Now dry brush is something you can combine with normal washes. So let's say you're painting the circle and I'm going to paint on the shaded side here, on what might be the shaded side. Dry brush is a great way to add a little texture that's not quite so smooth. To do it, 
you need to have very little water. It's good. This is a synthetic brush, and I think synthetic brushes are the best. It's good to have a little bit of snap, which this does. And I've got almost no water in my brush at all. Now, when I'm doing dry brush, a lot of times I will have a piece of uh, scrap watercolor paper nearby so that I can test because it's a very specific feel. Very, very dry. I know that may seem obvious. Very, very dry brush. The result uh, feels almost like uh, you're shading with a pencil. Like uh, you're shading with a colored pencil. It's, it's, it's a little weaker than that. But now where I think dry brush shines is in layers. Um, what I would do here and this is a little damp still right there, so I'm actually kind of lifting paint. It's a zone. It's a zone that you get your brush and your paint into. And I feel like it works best when there's already paint on the paper and you're adding to a color. And I keep that rag handy. I also keep paper towel handy because I'm constantly drying my brush out. I'm usually getting some moisture in there and it almost always needs to be taken out until look right here um until i'm getting just almost a uh, a shaded pencil effect and by the way this can be you can see up in this region it's more textural and if you're painting a subject that has some texture that's what's great about it but you can actually layer it i've got just a tiny i can't really get this on camera i've got just a tiny bit here but i'm coming just into the edge of this pool of color just barely. I don't want my brush to take up much of it at all. But here, see where I'm rubbing off this pigment. That's that's the best way I can describe it. It's like rubbing pigment off of your brush. And there's just enough moisture in your brush to transfer it. It's tempting, but don't get impatient with this technique. This is a slow process. But you, you can see, I hope, uh, that I'm starting to get a bit of a blend from color to no color. A, a transition. Now, practice this um, technique. Uh, you don't even need to, to practice shading something dis distinct. You can just come over here and, and practice the consistency. It should look something like this. I mean, if you've not seen dry brush, this is kind of what it looks like, but... My, my guess is most people have seen, and they know what dry brush is, it's, it's that feeling that you get in your brush when it's about to run out of paint and you feel the urge to go dip it in the paint again and get some more. When you get to that stage, resist that urge and just keep rubbing until you literally are not getting anything. That's the zone. That's, that's the zone you're looking for in dry brush. And it just has some really nice detailing advantages. So if I wanted to deepen the core shadow in this spear, for example, and really I probably should have waited. It's best doing wet over dry, not wet and wet. So this process is never done wet and wet. It's always wet on dry paper. And so you need to let the underlying layers dry. This was a little damp in here. And, I, and what happens is you end up picking up paint you end up rubbing it up but you can see i've got a pretty good blend there but i also have some nice uh interesting and usable texture depending on what i'm painting what i was using for that by the way was a princeton elite now that this brush while it's a, still a good performer is a bit on the worn side uh it's got a little bit of a fuzzy tip but that's actually perfect for dry brush um Another thing you can do, and I'm not going to really spend much time on this, is use uh, some other brushes that are dry that you have not uh, put paint in. So let's say you're painting. Well, I will demonstrate it. So let's put down some paint. I'm going to lay that brush down. I'm going to get out a brush, and this is an old, worn-out oil brush. Now what I do is I back brush into the water. Your first stroke won't produce anything, but it picks up some moisture as it goes back. And that may have dried a little too much. But I'm pulling that pigment out. 
Maybe I'll scumble a little right there. It's really important that this rough street be dry and you can blend that way. And I'm just I'm showing you these because these are other. This is sort of a cheap student grade brush. It's stiff, doesn't really hold a good point. This was an old worn out watercolor brush from years ago. It won't hold a point. Um, this one up is kind of damp, so I would actually wait until it was dried out. This is great for, uh, if it's dry, these hakes or hockey brushes, hockey brushes are great for, uh, dry brushing out the edges of a large wash area. But again, I usually will go back into the wash and then bring it out a little bit. Uh, it's something you've got to experiment with. Uh, there's no real like step-by-step, -step, here's exactly how you do it that I can show you. It's, it's a feel that you've got to get. So that's dry brush. But for this next technique, I'm going to use a brush with a really good point. This is a Trakel Protégé Plus. This is uh, Trakel's top of the line brush for watercolor. And I need a good point to do this technique. Let's get some blue this time. All right, we're going to go with our sphere again. We'll just make this a rough. All right, so you're painting along and you want a nice transition. We're thinking in terms of almost like line work. So what I'm doing is hatching, maybe cross hatching. So you're not really blending in the same way that you would here, uh, except that you can lighten your washes, but you are adding line work. And the more hatching you add, and as it gets lighter, the more subtle your, your blend becomes. So you pen and ink artists out here uh, can try this. You may be very comfortable with hatching or cross hatching. Now this adds very much like um, dry brush. This adds a nice textural feel. I'm getting to the point where more and more I like the feeling of texture rather than airbrush smooth washes. If you see some part of your wash or your blend that doesn't look smooth and transition enough, then just go in there with your point and do some more hatching. This takes some practice just like the dry brush does. But you get your, your washes light enough and after a point uh, you can't really even see the brush marks anymore. You could actually do it though where uh, you maybe do an intentional technique where you want to blend something you want to see the hatch marks. Very much like uh, if you were doing a pen and ink. Do a feather stroke. A feather stroke is a is a paint and lift, paint and lift, where it's like a pointed stroke. And maybe you're wanting those strokes to be visible. Don't have to just be using pen and ink when you do that. You can do that with watercolor. I mean, put some line work, some uh, hatching strokes into your work. You know, paint a solid area and get it to blend out. This is a fantastic technique for fur or hair, or maybe it's a, a fabric that has um, a bit of a weave visible in places. Go back in and see what's possible when you add over some lighter hatching strokes. Okay, that's a transition. That's a blend. It, it may be a coarse blend, but I, I can fine tune it so it's a little smoother as you saw here. Just great in areas where you don't want it to be so too glassy smooth. All right, let's move along here. I'm going to use some green this time. Another way to blend is with flat transitions, and that goes from very light flat washes to very dark flat washes. So let me let's go back to our sphere. You can hardly see that. Now this requires that I dry in between. Actually, I could do wet and wet, and that would be yet another way. I'm not going to get into wet and wet. I've covered that in other videos. What I want to show you is that you can create transitions with flat washes. They don't have to be this dark. So you start out, your first washes are very, very almost invisible. And I'm going to dry between each of these layers. And this is a technique that tends to look a little more stylized. I like using this, uh, even though I'm shading a sphere, I like using this on things like ground and trees where the shapes that make up the whole or, or the individual 
textures, shape textures that make up the whole are pretty distinct. But you still overall, like you take a tree, for instance, you still overall may have a shaded form. Because this is great for ground textures in landscape. But so far, both of those washes are flat. There's no blending at all. Let's try that layer. Let's go to the next layer. Now, the number of steps you use in these um, flat washes will determine how smooth it is. You can kind of see a, uh, a ridge, 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 ridge. Uh, basically, like I say, it's steps. But it's still a transition from dark to light. Let's see, I'm making pretty big jump here. Another layer and another step. Basically, and it gives you, uh, you know, and this is appropriate again in certain things. I, I would use this a lot in rocks and boulders, have used this a lot in rocks and boulders. You get these stepped transitions that are almost stylized. This is probably better demonstrated in a tree. So let me just do this as though I were uh, doing a, a tree. So that that's a blend using flat washes and stepped transitions. So another way to do a blend. And those steps can be more incremental, small, minuscule, like I did here. So I could still go in and add yet a darker step to that one. And you can adjust, I mean, along the way, you know. And one of the most powerful things about knowing and practicing all of these techniques is that you can combine them. You know, a soft blend in one part, a more stepped blend in another, or even in the same blend. And in fact, should be combined in a lot of cases. You're the artist. You have to determine what's appropriate. Your blends all don't have to look like this, although I strongly, strongly suggest you master this because of what it teaches you about water and pigment control. I never get tired of saying that, by the way. Can you repeat the part of this stuff where you said all about the uh, things? One final way, and this really relates to these two, is uh, either dry brush or hatching with texture. Uh, matching the texture of an object. Uh, the, probably the best example of this I can think of is a tree, is tree bark. If you get something that's that's heavily textural, in a lot of ways it actually can use some of this too. You are creating a transition with the texture shapes that that object provides. But I'm painting bark. You know, as I get out here, I, I let those white that white space show through. This is true of any kind of texture. You're cre you're still creating a type of a blend, a type of a transition. I can go in and in some of those white areas and fill in so that I don't have so much white. But try all of these. Try try creating uh, blends and transitions with dry brush, with uh, line work and hatching, uh, using the texture of the object that you're shading, using flat steps. Combine them. And this is really something, again, you need to experiment with. That was fun revisiting blending technique. Ask questions if you want to down in the comments. Hope you'll try all these. Hope you'll try to master all these because your painting will get so much better. Thank you for watching. Thank you so much patrons for your support. We'll see everybody in the next video. Bye-bye.